Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. For the first 60 years of the recorded music industry, things sounded awful. Well, relatively speaking. The quality of the recordings people had to put up with back then were, well, there's no other word for it. They were terrible. The old 78 RPM records played on gramophones were no match when it came to hearing music live. We just didn't have the technology to capture audio so that when we listened back, it sounded real. That began to change in the late 1940s with the introduction of vinyl records, the 33 and a third RPM vinyl album and the 7 inch 45 RPM single. It changed further with the switch to magnetic recording tape in the early 1950s. New microphones, better tape machines, and further understanding of acoustics when it came to building recording studios all played a part. Then came better turntables, better amplifiers and speakers. And finally, recorded audio started to sound more and more like the real thing. In the middle 1950s, people started to hear about something called high fidelity. It was a marketing term invented by the audio industry to describe equipment capable of producing music properly with proper fidelity. Once stereo recordings came along in the late 1950s, music fans went wild and started buying hi-fi gear for their homes, then their cars, then for going mobile. It was an endless pursuit for perfect sound, music that was loud, clean, clear, and accurate. Meanwhile, recording studios were constantly in a state of retrofitting and refurbishment because artists demanded the best for their music. That was the 1970s. In the 1980s, there was a reaction, a backlash, an artistic regression after the introduction of the compact disc. For some, music was now too perfect, too shiny, too unreal. They felt it contained none of the imperfections that made it human. Beauty, they thought, was in the mistakes. That's what made music authentic. Audio quality mattered less than being able to listen to music that obviously came from the heart. These music fans even had a name for this approach. If the best-sounding audio was high fidelity, then what they wanted was the opposite, low fidelity. And that aesthetic continues today. This is the history of lo-fi music. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. This is from a promotional film issued by the Recording Corporation of America in 1957. Shh, listen. Listening to great music, such as Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet, is always a thrilling experience. And through the remarkable achievements of modern electronic recording, a performance like this may be enjoyed in our homes whenever we please. It's true, of course, that listening to music at home is a matter of personal preference and taste. Now, here's a man named Smith. He's the relax and drink in the beauty of it all type of listener. What have we here? Another Smith? He's of the, look, Ma, I'm a conductor too school of listening. Hmm, looks like fun. And a third Smith? Yes, this Smith is one of those, did you hear that English horn over the viola tremolos type of listeners. Now, all these Smiths simply go to prove two things. One, different Smiths enjoy listening to music differently. Two, almost every home music lover is in search of the same thing. The truest, most lifelike reproduction of the original music possible. Okay, that is the opposite of what we're going to be talking about in this episode. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and welcome to the world of lo-fi, low-fidelity recordings and culture. Lo-fi is a philosophy, an artistic statement, a financial approach, and an attempt to get back to the basics when it comes to preserving music using basic equipment. And if the results sound a bit amateurish, it's okay, no problem. Lo-fi has given us some interesting, exciting, and often relaxing rock music. Lo-fi does not mean low quality, at least in an artistic sense. 
And if we're going to explore how all this came to be, we have to start with a song called Lo-Fi. This is from a Los Angeles band called The Exes. At first, like I mentioned at the beginning, all music and all rock music was lo-fi. The recording studios of the 1950s did the best they could with their brand new tape machines, their acetate cutters, and rudimentary audio consoles. Every attempt was made for recordings to sound as realistic as possible. I mean, why wouldn't you want the record to sound as if you were sitting in the same room as the artist? But high-quality recordings cost money. You needed to rent a studio, hire a producer, hire an engineer, buy recording tape, and spend time ironing out an infinite number of technical details, ranging from the number and type of microphones you needed to the speed at which you ran your tape deck. But what if you just wanted to perform your music and get it out there? Well, then you needed to cut some corners. But that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. If you wanted to authentically capture your sound, Why not just find a space, set up your instruments, and push record on whatever tape deck you could get your hands on? This was the philosophy of the Velvet Underground through 1966. They were a bunch of broke musicians hanging out with Andy Warhol's crowd who wanted to make a record. So they did, with a meager budget of maybe $1,500. And when that first album arrived in stores in March 1967, it was... well, it was not the best-sounding album out there. There was a lot of hiss, plenty of distortion, and a lot of errors in the recording process. The final mix was rough, and the stereo imaging, if you bought the stereo version of the record, wasn't very good. And Nico, the German singer imposed on the group by Andy Warhol, wasn't always in key. But you know something? Its primitive sound somehow added to its appeal, at least to a certain subset of music fans. I mean, was it rock supposed to be real and rebellious and from the heart? And what cost him share the to all tomorrow's parties? The Velvet Underground's records were generally derided for sounding bad, which made all kinds of sense in the late 1960s and the early 1970s because the goal back then was to achieve perfect sound or something close to it. In fact, records like this were held up as something that you weren't supposed to do. In 1977, R. Murray Schaefer, a Canadian-born music educator and composer, wrote a book called The Tuning of the World. In the glossary, he coined a brand new term, lo-fi, which he described as a unfavorable signal-to-noise ratio. Now, this really wasn't any kind of judgment call on the quality of a piece of music. It simply described recordings that were noisier with hiss and distortion than they should be in an era when high fidelity was treasured. It was music of low quality, at least in terms of sonics. Meanwhile, punk had happened. A central tenet of punk was do it yourself. Don't worry if you can't play or sing. If you have something to say, then say it by whatever means necessary using whatever budget you have. If it sounded amateurish and contained imperfections and mistakes, like if you were out of key or out of time occasionally, so what? For example, when Elvis Costello recorded his debut album, My Aim is True, in fits and starts throughout 1976 and 1977, he could only afford to use Pathway Studios in London. It was pretty primitive, outfitted with an old 8-track tape machine. With only about 2,000 pounds to spend, he had to work quickly. Most of the songs were recorded in one or two takes, and there was little overdubbing. He also used a very shrill-sounding guitar that he admits he really didn't know how to set up properly. Listening to the original version of My Aim is True can be sonically challenging because of all the hiss and recording imperfections, something that was almost unbearable on the first ever CD release of the album. Now, I would love to be able to play you something from that original edition, but I can't. The only versions I have are the subsequent re-releases that have been cleaned up and remastered to remove all the original bad stuff. But trust me when I say that a song like this was found to be practically unlistenable, not, again, because of the music itself, but because of the way it was recorded. If you listen closely, you can still hear some of that 
low fidelity imperfection. Music with low fidelity was pretty much written off at first. It was like, aw, you couldn't afford to make a better sounding record. But as time went on, a new appreciation for the warmth and realness of these kinds of recordings began to appear, not only among certain critics, but among fans who craved authenticity. They enjoyed primitive, unpolished approaches, and they didn't really want too much sophistication in their music. One such guy was R. Steve Moore. He came from a very musical background. His dad, Bob Moore, played on recordings by Elvis and Roy Orbison and was always in and out of recording studios. This led to Steve making recordings of his own, but at home with whatever gear he could cobble together with his dad, even if it was just a cheap cassette recorder or a secondhand reel-to-reel machine. By the late 1950s, Steve was putting out records through his own label. And here's an example of the kind of stuff that he made at home. This is from 1976, and it's called I've Begun to Fall in Love. love. R. Steve Moore was also in love with the cassette. The idea of being able to quickly record something on his reel-to-reel machine and then dub off copies onto cassettes for distribution was very appealing. That's when he founded the R. Steve Moore Cassette Club. From 1982 on, he'd make his music available to anyone via cassette. Members would get a list of his material, with each song annotated with a listenability quotient, which scored exactly how lo-fi the recording really was. Around the same time Steve was sending out cassettes to whoever wanted them, Daniel Johnston started doing the same sort of thing. Daniel suffered from bipolar disorder and was in and out of psychiatric institutions throughout his life. But one thing he found that he could do was make music. He'd record songs on cassette at home using a $59 Sanyo tape machine that he propped up on his parents' piano. Because he didn't have a way to make copies of these tapes, if he wanted more than one, he just performed the song again. Later, he would take these tapes to work at McDonald's in Austin, Texas, and during his shift, he would drop his cassettes into bags filled with Big Macs and fries. Others he'd give out or sell to people on the street. Some people found this a bit weird, but others appreciated what he was trying to do. Tape by tape, McDonald's bag by McDonald's bag, Daniel became a local cult favorite. The songs were honest, childlike, and deeply moving. He started playing gigs that were well attended, and then he somehow found his way into an MTV report on local music scenes. Here's an example of what Daniel was doing. This is from an album called Hi, How Are You? And the song is Walking the Cow. Try to point my finger, but the wind is blowing me around in the circle. Circle. Lucky star. Daniel kept releasing records like this throughout the 1980s, slowly becoming a lo-fi hero. He was also an important figure in a genre known as outsider music, which describes performers who may not be very good technically, but perform with such abandon and joy that you just can't help but like them. And in the early 1990s, when Kurt Cobain was spotted wearing a Daniel Johnston t-shirt, he became a major cult figure. Okay, wait, hold on. With Daniel giving away all those tapes, a lot of interesting people might have got their hands on them, wouldn't you think? Well, yeah, and that's part of the direction in which we'll go next. Calling someone's music lo-fi was something of an insult until the mid-1980s. But then, appreciation for this style of writing, recording, and performing began to bloom. It evolved from a recording technique into a full-fledged, standalone genre of rock. First, though, a couple of things needed to happen. In 1979, a company called Tascam introduced the TAC-144 Porta Studio. It was the size of, uh, I guess, a couple of modern-day laptops. And it allowed musicians to make multi-track recordings anywhere using cassettes instead of 
having to deal with a big, bulky reel-to-reel machine and all its tapes. In 1982, there was an upgrade, the TAC 244. The Porter Studio turned a cassette with its eighth of an inch wide tape running at one and seven eighths of an inch per second into a proper four track recorder. For example, a musician could record vocals on track one, guitars on track two, the bass on track three, and drums on track four. If you needed more than four tracks, it was possible to mix completed parts and bounce them down to another tape. Then that mixed track could be recorded back onto, say, track one of the original tape, leaving three more open for things like overdubs and additional instrumentation or vocals. The Porta Studio offered several other features that were once only available in a professional recording facility, making the audio quality of these units quite good. The only time things got kind of dicey was when you made multiple generations of a track. Whenever you do that, the audio quality begins to deteriorate. But because they were so portable, Musicians were able to make recordings virtually anywhere. Other companies got on board, too, and the word Porta Studio became a generic description of units not only made by Tascam, but Akai, Yamaha, Fostex, Sansui, Marantz, and a bunch of others. Now, we can do the same sort of thing with unlimited digital tracks with a laptop. Macs come with GarageBand. PC users can choose from a variety of digital audio programs, some that are really powerful and are free. But in 1982, the Porta Studio was a revelation. This is when we talk about Bruce Springsteen. He was a huge fan of the Porta Studio. Between December 17th, 1981 and January 3rd, 1982, he recorded nine tracks at his home using an early Porta Studio. These were supposed to be demos for the E Street Band to learn and then re-record in a proper studio. But when he and the band tried to capture the feeling of those demos, they found that they just couldn't. So, Springsteen made the decision to release this album as he originally made it, on cassette at home. This was the Nebraska album. Everything dies, baby, that's a fact. Maybe everything that dies someday comes back. Put your makeup on, fix your hair pretty, and meet me tonight in Atlanta City. Nebraska would go on to sell almost 2 million copies. Not bad. And if Springsteen could do this lo fi thing, why couldn't anyone else? Suddenly, the idea of recording at home seemed viable. This was an inspiration to several post-punk acts that were being grouped under the label of alternative rock. Again, capturing authenticity and realness was the goal. Slickness and shine were to be avoided. Hammer out something, dub it on a cassette, give it away. Or alternatively, sell cassettes at your shows. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Beat Happening was a band from Olympia, Washington. They were devoted to recording their music in a very, very, very basic sort of way. There was nothing fancy about the way they made their records. This is from 1985. It's a self-titled debut record. And uh, well, just listen. I went to this cafe. There she was again. So I said, hey, we should go swimming in Capitol Lake. We had a lot of fun. But then it got real late. So in an era when the recording industry wanted everyone to buy this shiny new thing called a compact disc with its super accurate sound, Fans of music made by groups like Beat Happening were really interested in something completely different. Other acts were also pursuing the same approach. One of the best examples is R.E.M., when they made their first recordings in the early 1980s. Their first single was made at Drive-In Studio in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. This was a very quick affair because A, it was supposed to be just a demo, and B, they didn't have any money. The result was kind of murky, kind of muddy, kind of tinny in places, definitely not high fidelity, but it had something. R.E.M.'s timing turned out to be perfect. 
That original Hib Tone single came out when campus radio stations started to gain influence and power when it came to new rock. This was the era of college rock, which for a while was an interchangeable term with alternative rock. Some independent labels, companies operating outside the major label system and therefore offering an alternative, really embraced this loose, rough, raw, back-to-basics, quasi-primitive, cheap and cheerful approach. It was unfancy and reactionary. It was primal. It was stripped back and occasionally a little distorted and wobbly. But it was cool, you know? The approach and audio quality lent a specific sort of context to the music. A lot of people really, really like this. Here's another example of the kind of music people were calling lo-fi in the middle 1980s. It's from a New Zealand band called Tall Dwarfs. It's from an EP entitled Slug Bucket Hairy Breath Monster. And the track is The Brain That Wouldn't Die. Now, I know a lot of today's music has that same sort of sound and vibe and feel as that one from Tall Dwarfs in 1985. But back then, that was so different. It was deliberately made to sound sonically inferior to the mainstream rock records of the day. Again, on purpose. What did you call that approach? A few critics, writers, and proponents on both sides of the Atlantic decided that since audio fidelity wasn't exactly high, then it had to be low fidelity or lo-fi for short. Around 1986, 1987, that term began to make the rounds. And by the end of the 1980s, lo-fi had evolved from an insult to a categorization, to a genre, to praise. More on that transition coming up. The late 1980s were a great time for lo-fi rock. It had become its own scene. The availability of good quality home recording equipment the reaction against shiny, overproduced mainstream rock, and the pushback against hair metal, which was very, very slick and shiny, made this approach very appealing to some people. I have another example. The Jesus and Mary Chain became one of the most important Scottish indie bands of the 1980s. In 1987, they issued an EP entitled Darklands. On it was this song made on a Porta studio. It's called On the Wall. By the time we get to the early 1990s, lo-fi was in full effect. Alternative music had blown up thanks to the success of grunge. You know, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, and so on. But below that was what some people called slacker rock, a style that was laid back while still being ragged around the edges. Lou Barlow went to a Sonic Youth show in Buffalo, New York, and after the show, he heard some of Daniel Johnston's music playing on a boombox. This was a revelation. It was the kind of music he was making using a couple of tape decks he bought at Radio Shack. Moving back to the Boston area, he joined with a guy named Jay Maskis in a band called Dinosaur Jr. When he wasn't working with them, Lou had his own lo-fi project he eventually called Sebado, which released music on a cassette-only label called Shrimper. Meanwhile, Robert Pollard was out in Dayton, Ohio, working with his band Guided by Voices using a Porta Studio unit. In New Jersey, a band called Silver Jews were recording their songs into a cheap machine that sort of just kind of sat on top of their TV. In Chicago, a woman named Liz Fair was making cassettes of her songs in her bedroom using the name Girly Sound. And out in California, a weird street musician kid named Beck David Campbell was experimenting with a weird sort of folk music when he wasn't busy alphabetizing the tapes in the porn section of the video store where he worked. He called it anti-folk. In 1993, he released an album entitled Golden Feelings, which was largely recorded in the living room of a friend. That was followed by another album entitled Stereopathic Soul Manure. Both were filled with live playing, sound collages, noise, and other experiments. That same year, he visited his friend Carl Stevenson, who had some decent recording gear and a drum machine. 
He looped a guitar a bit, added a drum track and a few samples, and threw in some sitar playing. Then Beck improvised a bunch of lyrics and tried to rap in the style of Chuck D of Public Enemy. And it just didn't work. He looked at Carl and said, Man, I am the worst rapper in the world. I'm just a loser. Carl said, Yeah, go with that. So Beck started singing, I'm a loser, baby, so why don't you kill me? Six and a half hours later, the song was done. The fidelity was solid, but the performance was deliberately ragged, which by 1994 qualified it to be categorized as lo-fi. So By 1995, the lo-fi approach had crystallized into something all its own. It was a legitimate and exalted approach to rock. If you were into this sound, you had plenty to choose from. There was Half Japanese, Billy Childish, Mountain Goats, Neutral Milk Hotel, Ween, Super Chunk, Royal Trucks, and literally dozens of others. Lo-fi became such an established mindset and process that it began to spawn offshoot subgenres such as hypnagogic pop, and chill wave and glow fi. Lo fi penetrated the hip hop aesthetic too, with a down tempo style known as chill hop. Same with electronic dance music, it has its own lo fi corner. Today, people use digital technology to try to emulate the fuzzy, buzzy analog sounds of the original lo fi practitioners. Some performers are deliberately adding hiss and background noise to try to achieve that old school effect that came naturally and, let's face it, it was unwanted. Lo-fi is its own thing today. Some people call it the adult contemporary music of the alternative world, and they're not wrong. While some of it can be pretty high energy and in your face, it can also be laid back, perfect for slacking off. If you were wondering when I'd finally get around to mentioning Pavement, here you go. This is a single from their 1992 lo-fi slacker classic, Slanted and Enchanted. It's called Summer Bay. All the shiny words Where on the protein delta strip In an abandoned house But I will wait there Relaxing, no? And yeah, it is supposed to sound that way. Lo-fi is just one of the many subgenres spun off by the alternative rock era of the mid-80s to mid-90s. If you like your music loose with that analog warmth, there's plenty to explore in this area. Today, it lives on in many different forms. For example, if you've ever heard the term Bedroom pop, that's a spin off of lo fi. This is music consisting of home recordings using a laptop instead of an old school portal studio cassette unit. It can be dreamy, intimate, and introspective. But not all bedroom pop is lo fi. You'll know it when you hear it. There are literally hundreds of ongoing history podcasts available on all the platforms. Grab whatever you want, they're all free. I'm on all the social media platforms at the moment. I have my website, a journal of musical things.com, for the latest in music news and information. Plus, there's the free daily newsletter. I also have another podcast called Uncharted Crime and Mayhem in the Music Industry. If you like true crime with your music, then this is for you. Rob Johnston is the technical producer of this show, something that he does mostly on a laptop at home. And I record my bits in a home studio. Does this make us lo fi? I don't know. Maybe. Talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross.